Okay, welcome everybody. On behalf of Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust, we are happy to welcome you this morning for our virtual program. <clears throat> My name is Michael Morgenstern and I'm an educator at the museum. This morning, I'm pleased to welcome you to this talk with Ava Perlman, a Holocaust survivor from France. For those of you who haven't been to the museum before, ours is the first Holocaust survivor founded Holocaust Museum in the United States. In the 1960s, a group of survivors worked together to create a memorial for their loved ones who perished in the Holocaust. And this memorial eventually became our museum. Those survivors who established our museum did so with the mission to commemorate educate and inspire future generations. Even though we're not able to be in our museum's physical space for the time being, we are still able to carry on this mission of theirs. And by the way, for those who are unfamiliar, my virtual Zoom background is the meeting. This morning, you have the honor and privilege of listening to Ava Perlman, who will share her story with you. Ava just started speaking at our museum shortly before the pandemic started, but uh, for the last few months, she's been such a crucial part of our programs that we've been doing with students on Zoom um, almost twice a month at least. And so it's, I'm really happy to welcome her today. After Ava shares her story with you, you can type in questions and she'll answer as many as possible. So Ava? I'm honored to welcome you to this Zoom talk. So thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I am the one who is honored to be asked to speak to, to everyone today. Um, thank you so much. Uh, my story is, uh, I'm kind of nervous uh, <laughs> because it's a long story and I will have to make it a bit shorter. I will share my screen with you. Oh, come on. Why doesn't it work? It worked earlier. Do you see the the green? I see on it the here. Bottom? Yes, I see it. I, I why doesn't it work now? It worked all the time. It worked earlier. Here okay. we go. Did you see it? Are you seeing it? I'm not. Um maybe Try clicking Alt and S on your keyboard. Type what, sorry? Alt, the, the Alt button on your keyboard yeah, and, and then the letter S. F, F? S, S as in screen, S. Oh, I see it, I see it on my screen. You don't see it? I don't know. Okay, let me, let me. Get out of Ava, would you like me to share it on my screen? Can you take mine on your screen? I can, I have your, your presentation. Let me share it on my screen. Okay, why doesn't it work on mine? Because then I know when to get, go to the next one. Ah. It's okay, you know what, it's okay. You can, you can just tell me next when you're ready. Okay, let me get out of here, oh. Do you see it on mine now? Oh, yeah, plus a me goes bravo, this one? Okay, it. And can I move it? No, it, you, if you just say next, I'll move it for you. Oh my God. It's okay, it'll, it'll be fine. We can do this. Oh, that's just what I wanted to avoid. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let me go back to Zoom. I can't even go back to Zoom. Okay, well, I see only one slide on. on. So do you have the first slide which shows a little, a little village in Germany in the 1920s, in the 1900s? Oh, I'm on the wrong. first slide. First slide. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So okay. Go, go to the next. This is the, the village taken from a postcard where my mother was born in 1910. A small village. This is the central um, central square. And my grandfather had his shop in one in, in this big house in the on the right. Uh, I don't know which one it was, but he had a jewelry store there. He was a jewelry maker. Um, 
my mother was born and two years later she had a little brother next and this is my family next next there there my grand my maternal grandparents with my mother on the left charlotte and her brother two years younger in the middle alfred and so they grew up in this little village um, my grandmother got very sick when my mother was five years old and my mother at that time swore to herself that she would become a doctor to take care of her family and this carried her all the way through her studies although she already um, experienced quite a bit of anti-Semitism, especially in high school. Uh, grave anti-Semitism. And uh, one story is she went with a friend of hers who was the daughter of a wealthy Protestant owner, a landowner. Uh, she was invited with them to a ball and she went as one of them. So everybody thought she was a Protestant like everyone else. And a young man uh, took a look at her and danced her, with her all night. He was so taken with her. She was about 15 or 16. Um, and so that he, he invited her out and she was too shy and too scared to tell him she was Jewish. Uh, and uh, one day on the way back from high school, when she had to take the train to go home, he jumped on the train with her. And in the train, during the trip, he talked to her about love and marriage and he wanted to meet her parents. So she said to him, you know, I have to tell you something, I'm Jewish. And he got red to the root of his hair. He got up without a word, picked up his hat from the rack up on the top and walked out without a glance at her and without a, a, a word. And this was really very traumatizing for her, not that she really cared for this young man, but it was such a blow to her self-esteem that this also uh, unfortunately tainted the rest of her life. She, I, I think she had a great inferiority complex and, and she shouldn't have, but that is how it started. So next slide, please, they grew up. My mother was in 1929, she started medical school in Berlin uh, and the, the following year she met my father and the year after that in 1931 they were married. Her, her main uh, fear when he asked her to marry him, what about my studies? And he said, no, 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 you can do what you can continue with your studies, no problem. And they got married in 1931. And I was born in 1932, just nine months after the wedding, uh, and just eight and a half months before Hitler came to power in January 33. My uncle on the left, Alfred, uh, went very early on already to Palestine with his new bride. <clears throat> and my, uh, as soon as Hitler started cracking down on the Jews, uh, the Jews could no longer work and earn a living. So my father was a patent attorney and he was lucky enough as a patent attorney to have a colleague in France as he had colleagues in different other countries because when you patent inventions in one country you want to patent them in other countries as well. So you work with other people in different countries and Monsieur Placereau from Paris wrote to my father and said if you, if things become too dangerous in, in Germany, just come over here to Paris and you'll work with us. And my father not only had this luck, but he also had the wisdom to take Monsieur Placereau at his word and to say, yes, okay, we are going to come over. So in the summer, so my, uh, so in the summer uh, of 33, my father already went over to Paris and started working there. My mother and I were still in Berlin. I was born in Berlin. I, I didn't say that, sorry, in May of 32. Um, we stayed in a, an apartment adjacent to my father's parents' apartment, my, grand, my paternal grandparents. And it is actually my grandparents who took care of me when I was a baby because my mother was in school and my father at work. And <clears throat> they stayed for now in Germany. Um, what is next? Yeah, it, so my mother continued still at the university until, next slide, 
she received a letter. Next slide, please. No, the following. Yeah. Uh, she received this on October 3rd, 33, in German, which says, you are hereby excluded from further studies at the University of Berlin because you have been involved in Marxist activities, which was totally wrong. My mother was no political activist. She just joined a socio-democratic student group on campus so that she could have free access to the library to go study because she didn't have uh, money for books. And she, it also gave her access to the kosher cafeteria on campus where she could eat uh, at a discount. So she had very little money. She lived with my grandfather, my, my grandfather in Berlin, so that she didn't have to pay for uh, her abode. Um, and she, that's how she got through her studies. Um, so by October 3rd, she was thrown out of the university along with all the Jews, all the doctors, surgeons, lab technicians, nurses, all the Jews out of the hospitals, the university from everywhere. They had 20 minutes to uh, get to their lockers, empty their lockers and dis disappear. And by the way, I wrote a book which came out a few months ago and it is full of all the details which I am forced now to leave because it's, it's, it's a matter of time. But if you want the whole story, uh, I will show you the book later. So next slide. So my mother started to pack and, and, and uh, plan her move with me uh, to join my father. Then my uncle had gotten himself uh, an apprenticeship in a large industrial farm uh, farming uh, place because he wanted to learn uh, great agriculture the, the motorized way and his boss received this particular letter on November 33 and the translation goes after our last meeting in mid-October I directed you to dismiss your apprentice in me in the next few weeks the 21 year old Jew I have been informed that you have not done so Besides, this Drew had the insolence to speak back to me. It is unacceptable that today a Jew should still be employed in agriculture while our German brothers suffer from need and hunger and are unable to find employment with their own kind. You are hereby ordered to dismiss this Jew or else I will have to take further action. Heil Hitler, Walter, uh, leader of the group uh, of whatever. So pretty soon thereafter, uh, while my mother was preparing, I don't know exactly the, 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 the weeks, but uh, pretty soon my uncle and my new aunt took off for Palestine. Next slide, please. And this is what, what Palestine looked like at the time and the mode of transportation there. Uh, you can see, I mean, I, I'm sorry, it's a, it's, not, it's a poor slide, but it gives you an idea um, what Israel was at the time. Next, I have another slide. Uh, also, that's how they traveled, and they went to the kibbutz, kibbutz uh, Kvarsol, which my uncle and aunt helped to found. <clears throat> so back to us in Paris. Um, what is the next slide? I don't know. Yeah, uh, back. So my mother and I got in, in October or November of 33, we arrived in Paris to join my father and it took my mother six weeks to find a suitable apartment and we found one in Courbevoie, uh, a suburb of Paris, which was a large apartment building where there were already many German Jewish refugees living. And this is uh, where we met Mr. and Mrs. Levier. Uh, remember their name because they become important, Claire and Serge Levier, and, and their daughters, Michelle, who was 10 years older than me, and Maggie, her younger sister, who was five years older than me. And we, we became friends, and our parents especially became friends. Uh, in 1935, so my father continued to work as a patent attorney with Monsieur Placereau, 
uh, a very, very kind man, uh, not Jewish, but understanding the plight of the Jews. And he really liked my father because he had worked with him for several years before that. So in 1935, my parents had a son the day before my third birthday, Ernest, in uh, May of 1935. And we, and, and then my parents decided we'd better go and get some other place to live. We need a house, I mean, with two children. And we went to Le Vésinet. And that little red dot on, on the map is about there, uh, more or less, yeah, uh, more or less. So in 1939, um, my mother got pregnant again and all her friends were in arms. Charlotte, Rodolphe, how can you do this? How can you be pregnant again when we are about to go into war? This, uh, so this was in the uh, uh, fall of 1938, going into 39. Uh, and my parents said, look, we have two children. We'll have a third one and we'll be extra careful. What can I say? We will do the best we can. And unfortunately, many of my parents' friends never had more than one child, if they had any. So I was very lucky that I got two brothers. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, during this time also, my grandparents from Driesen, my maternal grandparents, had moved to Berlin because they, they, nobody went to their store anymore, except maybe they, they, nobody went to the Jew to buy anything, except a few young men who went to buy some gold wedding rings uh, because they, they wanted to marry their sweethearts before they were enlisting in the army. So they moved to, so my grandparents moved to Berlin and there my grandfather uh, bought a lot of silver and jewelry from Jews who needed to leave and who needed the money, who wanted the money. So he accumulated a certain amount of silver and, and jewelry. Uh, so in the beginning of 39, my, my father sent his in-laws, my maternal grandparents, tickets on to take a ship to leave from Marseille to go to China. Uh, and you want to see the next slide? Uh, there, this is the ticket. So it, it's dated September 3rd, uh, uh, sorry, 9th of March, the, the way the Europeans read the, the dates. On the 9th of March, the Trinton, ship Trinton should leave from Marseille. And these, these tickets were to allow my grandparents, first of all, to get out of Germany. They had to show that they had tickets for somewhere else. And uh, next slide, I think, is my grandfather. No, it's OK. So, uh, so my, my, my grandmother wrote to my mother and said, look, we are packing. Uh, we are sending you two trunks with all kinds of old stuff that we can't take with us. So please keep everything in case we can get back together eventually. So when my mother was eight and a half months pregnant with an uh, eight and a half pound baby, she was, an enor she was just enormous. She received a letter to go to the central railway station in Paris to uh, pass customs for two trunks. So she took a taxi and got there and the official was extremely uh, uh, disagreeable. He said, oh, you foreigners, he heard that she spoke French with a German accent. He said, you foreigners, why don't you go back where you came from? We don't need you here. And open those trunks. <clears throat> and my mother got so furious and angry and, and vituperated. She said, if, if your parents were in the danger of their lives, wouldn't you do anything to have them come over or, or whatever? And she got so angry that he was afraid she would have the baby right on the spot. And he finally said, you know, just take your junk and, and get the hell out. So my mother took the trunks home in her taxi and opened them at home. And sure enough, there were lots of old, old clothes on the top, but underneath was a lot of jewelry that you see here. This is only a small amount of what my family still has. Uh, it's, it's all still in my family. All that silver that my grandfather hoped to save in those trunks. So this is one of the first miracles that I can remember. I mean, had my mother not been so 
genuinely angry had she known what was in the trunks she would not have been so gen genuinely angry she would have been scared to death that they would conf confiscate everything or have her pay i don't know how much to to take all this silver <clears throat> and had she not been pregnant and uh, then the man would not have been afraid that she would have the baby right on the spot i mean the, 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 the coming together of several circumstances at the right time uh, to, to save something or us or whatever is, uh, many people say it's um, coincidences. I choose to say they are miracles because there were too many all through my life, throughout my life, even now, there are still miracles in my life that happen just out of the blue. And I'm grateful. So anyway, sometimes ignorance is bliss as my mother um, experienced. So, so my mother went to a Catholic clinic to have the baby because that is where her obstetrician uh, wanted to deliver his patients. So she had no choice, she went to this clinic and the nun came into her room after she had the baby and found my mother in tears. So she said, Madame, you just had such a beautiful baby. What, wh why are you crying? And my mother said, I don't know where my parents are. They were supposed to leave Germany, supposed to go on a boat to Shanghai. We haven't heard a word from them. It's now the 13th of April. Uh, we don't know where they are. Uh, actually, it doesn't make sense because the, 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 the boat was going on the, 9th, on the 3rd of September. I don't know, now I'm a little flustered because the, the dates don't jive. But anyway, that's what happened. And the, 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 my mother said, I'm deathly worried about my parents. And then the nurse said, um, I wish I were Hitler's nurse. And my mother said, sister, how can you speak like this? You would like to take care of Hitler? And the nun said, no, I would give him a suppository of dynamite. And my mother said, sister, you are a religious woman. How can you say this? And the nun says, well, for Hitler, I'll make an exception. That is a little story that I found in my mother's um, uh, tapes, which I didn't know before. Anyway, so we finally eventually heard the next slide that my grandparents, instead of boarding, they got to Marseille and instead of boarding a ship to China, they boarded an illegal ship to Palestine. And this is the front page, the front cover of a, uh, a, a, uh, a journal or a magazine uh, that appeared in Palestine. And my grandmother is on the left at the bottom, the left bottom there, yeah. Oh, I can even show with my, okay. So they had a very tough trip, six weeks on the water. They arrived in Palestine, the British turned them away. They went to Cyprus, they, then they were on the water again. They gave everything they possessed over the six weeks, including their wedding rings, to get a glass of water or a potato to eat. Uh, they were really in dire need when they arrived finally and were let go in the water and walked through, from, through the water to the, to the beach. Oh, this is nice what I saw there so I can see what the next slide is. So anyway, uh, so we, we found out that they were safe in Palestine and my, bro my uncle was there, to, their son, to welcome them and took care of them. And he eventually helped them to buy a small grocery store in Palestine, in Gedera, south of Tel Aviv. In the meantime, so in the meantime, my other grandparents, my paternal grandparents who stayed in Berlin and who had been taking care of me when I was a baby, finally got their passports in July of 39 to leave Germany and came to join us in Le Vésiné in our villa and lived with us. <clears throat> and my grandfather uh, started telling me a few Jewish jokes, uh, which made a jokester of me for the rest of my life. I love to tell jokes and make people laugh. And nobody else in my family loves to tell jokes or and they hardly not, not laugh much at my jokes. So anyway, and also my grandfather brought me the Grimm and Anderson fairy tales 
in German, and I taught myself to read those in the German script, you know, the Gothic script, uh, and I became a hopeless romantic <clears throat> and always waited for my prince to come when I was a teenager. So anyway, um, we go on in France. Oh, you didn't, there's the next slide here. My grandparents who came, uh, my grandfather had been an educator and he had a PhD. He was uh, the director of a school for boys, a teacher's training college for boys. And uh, my grandmother, and they came over uh, and there are the three of us. I am now seven. And this is August 1939, I'm seven, Ernest is four, and the baby is four or five months old, and he doesn't look too, too well, uh, but they lived with us. So by 1940, next slide please. By 1940, Monsieur Placereau asked my father to go further south, to leave us, and to go south somewhere to a little place and take the archives of the, of the office with him. Some of the archives uh, had, were national security archives. And it was a way to shelter my father, who looked much more Jewish than the rest of us, by the way, uh, uh, to shelter my father from the Nazis who were starting to come down from the north, uh, from, from up here, they, they were coming towards Paris. So it would put my father away and the archives at the same time. And we went to a tiny place near Issoudun. This is Issoudun here. Uh, <clears throat> but we were in a small place near it. My father rented an old little castle and hired an old lady to take care of us children. Um, and when there were bombings, we were alerted with the sirens and we all had to to uh, run into the basement or the cellar really uh, and come out when it was done. And uh, after one of those bombings, we found out that a large cheap piece of bomb had come through the glass roof of the veranda under which my father had his desk, uh, desk and office uh, on a desk chair. And it went straight through the chair. So had he stayed at his, at his chair, he would have been killed instantly. Another one of these, thank God we went into the basement. Um, I, uh, I was suddenly taken with uh, severe abdominal pains. The doctor came right away and said, take your daughter to the hospital. She needs to be uh, operated on immediately. She has acute appendicitis. So they took me to Issoudun, uh, where there was a big hospital. And my father was told, oh, you are in luck. Uh, there's a big surgeon from Paris who is just here today to do a few operations. And he operated on me and afterwards told my father, I was eight. He told my father, uh, we are lucky that we caught it uh, because her appendix would have burst in the next 24 hours and she would have been gone. We had no antibiotics in those days and I would not have made it. So I was very lucky. I was in a ward, I remember, with other soldiers who were wounded in a big ward full of people and the young man next to me died uh, on my watch and I remember it to this day. <clears throat> what we didn't know is that in January of 1941, my grandfather who stayed in Paris with my grandmother and my, my mother and the baby uh, he died of pneumonia suddenly. And my mother had no way to let my father know that his father had passed away. And she was alone there with an elderly woman and a baby to arrange the funeral uh, all by herself in Le Vésinet. <clears throat> so by 1941, uh, beginning of 1941 or so, my father decided Marseille was becoming dangerous and we went to the next stop, Lyon, as you see it there, Lyon. And he um, uh, rented an apartment in Caluire, which is in the suburbs of Lyon, and which, is, which was the top floor of a big house uh, on which the, the landlord and landlady, Monsieur and Madame Giron, 
lived on the first floor and underneath on the street level, Monsieur Giron had a huge carpentry shop. And he and, and there were noises with saws all the time, I remember, and we played among all the boards that were stacked in the yard that he needed for his work. <clears throat> Very kind people. So we found that apartment and, and then my mother tried to, so remember, we are going to go to the next slide, but remember to see Grenoble here and this area here eventually, which I will mention. Okay, next slide, please. France was divided into two zones, the, occup the occupied zone, the light pink one, and the blue one, which was still the free zone. And so my mother, my, my grandmother and the baby uh, tried, they, they wanted to come and join us in Lyon. But at the, at the, at the border, at the, the Vichy government, which was pro-Nazi, had very unpleasant people there. And when my mother and the elderly lady and my, the baby arrived, the official was very unkind. And he said, uh, you and the baby, you can go. The old woman stays behind. And again, my mother said, there's no way I will leave her behind. I'm staying with her. If you force us to stay here because you won't let her through uh, and anything happens to us, it will be on your conscience. So she made such a fuss again that he finally said, just go. Had to get rid of them, you know, F off. That's how my mother passed the border there. She was a very strong woman and a very brave one. And really, we owe all our lives to her for several, several times. So um, in 41, we, I still remember we had a sailor uh, near Lyon, and the Monsieur and Madame Levier, whom we met in Courbevoie, followed us to Lyon, and they came to our se Passover Seder. And there, their daughter, Michelle, met a young man who was the son of another one of our guests, and he was really taken with her. And they got married a, a year later. Um, so that I wanted to say. And then, my, my parents, this was beginning of 42, my parents decided Lyon is becoming dangerous because the Nazis are coming down further. Uh, and my mother went to that area uh, on the left of Grenoble, west of Grenoble that I showed you on the map, which was a mountainous area with lots of small valleys, narrow valleys, not as, as wide as our San Fernando Valley here, but bordered by by small mountains uh, all around um, and, and nice trees all over. And she went to one children's home after another. That whole area was speckled with children's homes, which before the war acted like either boarding schools for some children, but for most, most children, it was like a luxury camp. So it was not in a camp like we know here, the camps, but a regular house. Next slide, please. Uh, that would have dormitories and which would keep the children at 3,000 feet altitude in good weather, good air. Uh, they had good food. They were taken on excursions and taken care of while the parents could have a nice, nice little vacation by themselves for two weeks or three weeks or whatever. And my mother went to 30 of those homes and they were all full. They all said, I'm sorry, madame, you have three children. We just cannot take them. Uh, we, are, we have too many already. And the last one in Autran called Clairefontaine uh, was willing to take us. Her last chance, uh, and my mother was desperate to park us somewhere where we would be sheltered from what was going on in the cities. And uh, Madame Montonex was very kind, very kind woman. She said, I will take your children. And my mother saw the crucifix on the wall and said to her, I know that you are a devout Christian and I, I appreciate that and I respect it, but I hope you are not going to try and convert my children. And Madame Montonex assured her that, I, that she wouldn't. And she didn't. I ended up going to mass with all the other kids on Sundays but that's beside the point. It was not her doing, it was mine. Uh, in the meantime, oh, next slide. 
there is Madame Montonex standing next to me. I'm, I mean, I'm standing next to her. And Ernest is here. This is Ernest. I don't know where Raymond is. He was there with us, but he probably was uh, having a nap or something uh, because he is not on the, on the picture. So my mother came to see us. Oh, and you saw the, the slide before. Can you go back one, please? Uh, you saw the mountains. These were the kinds of mountains that were all around the valley. Not very high, but all treed and beautiful. Okay, so, so then um, my mother came to see us with just a, a, a weekend bundle. And as she was leaving, she received a telegram from my father, stay up there, I'm coming. So my father had finally decided it was time for him to disappear as well, uh, to, to find shelter somewhere, because Lyon was being becoming too dangerous. So here we are, the family of five with my parents and the three of us in Autran. Uh, <clears throat> so my, my parents, of course, took us out of Clairefontaine. Uh, and Madame Montonex said, if ever you need me or anything happens, give me the children, no questions asked, park the children with us, they'll be safe. <clears throat> and my parents even made arrangements with them a little later on, I guess, that if anything happened to them, they would take care of us and send us to Monsieur Placereau in Paris, who would then send us after the war to Palestine to be with my uncle and my grandparents. So my father uh, rented a house. We called it the yellow house. Next slide, because it was yellow. It doesn't show on the map, but that's the house here. Uh, our landlord and landlady, Monsieur and Madame Raveau, lived down here, and we lived upstairs. So there was only one entry to the house, and the staircase went straight up to the fl top floor where we rented. And here's a little church, and that's a tiny village, really, uh, and, uh, and a country road. Um, next slide, our landlord and landlady, very nice people. Uh, with two daughters, the young one, Colette, my age, and the older one, already probably 19 or 20, um, Georgette. And we lived there for a while. Uh, and, but my, my mother came to a kitchen that had hardly anything in it. And she said, oh my goodness, I came here with my bundle for overnight with a few clothes. I, I have to, to set up shop here. I mean, I need uh, indispensable things for my kitchen. I have to go back to Lyon to pick up a few things. So it was dangerous, but she still went. She took the bus up the mountain and down to the valley, to the train station, then the train from Grenoble to Lyon. Outside of the train station in Lyon, she took a tramway across the river to the, where she had to get off in Caluire to uh, um, run up the, 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 the hill to, and, and the house was upstairs, up on the top of the hill where we lived, about a mile up the road. And she came to Madame Giron and uh, she, she came to her, our apartment. She made, she packed up a whole bundle in a big basin that she wanted to use to boil our, our linen because we didn't have washing machines in those days. We had nothing except maybe a radio that wasn't even allowed. <clears throat> and uh, Madame Giron said she took our radio to her house to keep it safe in case the Germans came upstairs. Uh, and she took our silver and buried it in the yard just to protect it in case. Um, and they had a nice cup of tea when my mother was ready to go and they went nicely talking and suddenly my mother said, oh my God, I'm going to miss, I can't miss my, my train. So she said a very quick uh, thank you and goodbye and ran down that hill with her heavy load and arrived at the tramway, which went every 15 minutes and it was about to leave. So she jumped on it and he left. Miracle. She went along the river. Uh, next slide. This is just a picture to show you about what, so the Rhone crosses Lyon just like the Thames crosses London and the Seine crosses Paris. So the, 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 the 
right, the station was about here in this corner and the tramway arrived from here and went along the Rhone River and my mother got off at a bridge a pedestrian and car uh, and, and automobile bridge. And she ran across it with her heavy load and arrived on the platform of the train as the man was whistling. And she jumped on the train, she just barely made it. And there was another bridge parallel to this one for the train. And as the train started to go this way across the bridge in the opposite direction from the one she just ran over, she was looking out the window, still breathless and taking off her, her hat when she saw that the, the Nazis had cordoned off the bridge at both ends and were looking for papers. And her identity card was Charlotte Gutmann, born in Germany. She would have gone, she would have been gone. A matter of maybe two or three minutes or five minutes at most that she crossed that bridge to run for her train. I mean, go figure. And she came home to Autran. So next, next slide tells me, I tell you how we lived in Autran. Uh, my father took his bicycle and went, did the rounds of all the, we lived nicely in that upstairs of the yellow house. Uh, but we, my father had to scrounge for food and he went to all the, uh, three times a week, he took his bicycle and made the rounds of all the farmers and bought one or two eggs here and a cup of milk there. And he exchanged his cig cigarette tickets and his alcohol tickets for more food. And he brought home whatever he could get. And we, we just had enough not to starve. Uh, I learned to make butter with the cream that we creamed off the, the, the top of the milk because it came straight from the cow. It was not pasteurized or anything. And I learned to make butter. Um, I could go to school. There was a school there for boys, a boys high school, which we call a high school. Uh, in, in France, high school starts at 10, at, at the age of 10 or 11, uh, later, earlier than here. And they took a few girls because of the circumstances. Autran was a small village of usually a thousand inhabitants. And at that point, they had 2000 people living there. That means half the population was in hiding for one reason or another, not just Jews. There were all kinds of people there. Anyway, so I could go to school and my father was able to continue working for Monsieur Placereau for the bureau which had established a, another one in Lyon. And a, every week, a secretary from the Lyon office would take the train from Lyon to Grenoble. My father would meet her taking the bus from Autran down to Grenoble. They would meet in a coffee shop. He would give her the files that he worked on the week before, and she would bring him new files to work on so that he continued working part-time all through our hiding in that village. He was such a wonderful man and we owe him so much. We owe actually so much to righteous Gentiles who unfortunately didn't risk their lives enough to be inscribed at Yad Vashem. That's too bad because they really helped us tremendously. Several and all our landlord and landladies uh, in Lyon, in, in Autran, um, so so my father continued to work and all by hand. He didn't even have a typewriter. He did everything by hand. My, he found a, a cave. He looked for a cave somewhere in the mountain where he parked a few hard boiled eggs and some water, drinking water and money. So that if we had to suddenly leave our house because the Germans were coming up the hill, which was always a possibility, uh, the farmers would uh, uh, he found three farmers who agreed to take one of us each uh, in case my father, my parents had to take off into the hills if the Nazis came to Autran. Um, uh, oh, and my mother needed, they wanted new identity cards. So my mother went to our little city hall and asked for them and was told by the the, the guy there, well, we cannot change the cards unless these become illegible. 
So my mother just went home and they accidentally fell in the wash. And the next day they were dry and dry enough and illegible. And my parents got new cards and the guy in the, the city hall also uh, made, the, the, made the date like 1941, even though we were already in 1943. Um, and they looked very good and they were born in Belgium and in, in North Africa and they had French last names. <clears throat> and we always had false al alerts um, uh, that the Nazis might come up the, the, the hill. Now, it was mountainous. They had to come all the way up the mountain, the chain of the mountainous chain, and then go down to the other side where we were. And the roads, of course, were very windy and very narrow, and the Nazi equipment was very bulky, and very often they tried to come up and they had to back down again. But each time they came up, we had a, there was a network of warning us everywhere. The first post office down in the valley near Grenoble that saw the Nazis trying to come up the hill would phone the next post office. That, that post office would phone the third. The third would phone the fourth. From each post office, as soon as they got the news, the Nazis are coming up, uh, two people would run, one to the hotel, one to the baker. From the hotel and the baker, two people would run to this pay person and that person. Within five minutes, everybody in the whole area knew the Nazis are coming and they were able to take off into the woods. <clears throat> oh, however, we had many false alerts. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to say for this here. Okay, so we lived like this um, until, yeah, next slide. That just tells me it's the 14th of July, 1944. The Americans, the wonderful Americans had come to Normandy and we were hoping against hope that the end of the war would soon be with us. Uh, and we went on a picnic that night, that, that day, on one of the big hills uh, closing our valley. It was closed by a big hill. And we were on the top there for our picnic, where we could see our valley below on one side. And on the other side, we saw the whole, the whole landscape uh, on the other side, towards Grenoble, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, we saw suddenly and we heard planes coming. And my father said, oh, I hope these are, these must be allied planes. And as we watched them, we followed them with our eyes. And as we watched them, we saw this, they suddenly started bombing our valley. So obviously they were Nazi planes, not American ones or allied ones. And we ran down the hill and my father said to my mother, if I am going to die, I will die with a weapon in my hand. So the next day, he and Serge Levier, remember our friends from Courbevoie who followed us to Lyon, they followed us to Autran as well, and we were living in Autran also with their daughters. And Michelle, who had married Henri, uh, whom she met at our Seda, remember, she had a baby one year old. Uh, and they were living there. Um, we were, uh, okay. Uh, and my father and Serge and Serge's son-in-law, Henri, decided to enlist in the underground forces, the underground French forces, who were also situated not far from where we were, because we lived on a high plateau, which was difficult of access, and that's why the Germans had such trouble coming up. Uh, and that is also where the underground French forces were located. Um, <clears throat> so... They left, next slide just shows the, the, the countryside. You see it was green, it was beautiful. Of course, it was not winter like this slide is showing, but this is to give an idea of the, the size of the mountains all around and nicely treed, uh, full of trees where you can hide. Uh, and um, it was a beautiful area. So the men are gone and the women and children have to fend for themselves and the Germans, the Nazis, come to Autran. Next slide, please. This tells me, the swastika there just tells me that the Germans are coming. So it keeps me chronologically correct here. Um, now, 
it was a miracle again that the men had left. They were now with the, the, the French army because they all looked quite Jewish and they would not have fooled any Germans, but they were gone. So I remember them, I, I remember the little silhouettes coming along the, the, the hill at night, at dusk. And the next morning we opened our shutters and there was a farm burning here and a farm burning there where there were suspicious activities going on. And suddenly uh, our landlord, we heard a heavy knock on the front door downstairs. And our, we heard our landlord call my mother and say, Madame, can you please come and help me? And my mother went down the stairs, leaving three Jewish kids upstairs, coming down the stairs to meet two, two, uh, uh, two, Nazi two uh, Nazis, one officer and his orderly. You can, I cannot imagine what my mother have, has gone through. Anyway, our landlord, Monsieur Raveau, said to her, Madame, I don't know German, they don't know French, what do they want? Can you be the interpreter? So my mother was the interpreter and spoke very pidgin German with them, uh, just lining words on together, not look, looking for a word and then mispronouncing it the French way. And, uh, but, but she understood, of course, that what, they, that what they wanted was a bedroom, a room to sleep. They would eat at our landlord and landladies and they slept up. So, so, so the, the landlord said, well, madame, your husband is gone. Why don't you give your, your bedroom? We have to give them a room. And, uh, and I will give you a foldable bed to take to the attic. So we had those two Germans, the Nazis, sleeping next to the three Jewish children for two full weeks. The orderly came into our kitchen to bake a cake, a chocolate cake for his boss. And my mother was hoping that he would give a few crumbs for the children, but he didn't. Um, the officer was sitting against the wall of the house in the sunshine one day and saw my little brother, Raymond, uh, how old was he for, on the swing. And he said to our, our, our um, a landlord, you see that little guy there, he reminds uh, me of our nice German children. Little did he know. Um, so my mother spent two weeks at the window of the attic. She did not sleep. She had no news from my father because this was, this was uh, two or three weeks after the men left, we had no news from them. We had no idea where they were, if they were still alive. <clears throat> and she was afraid that my father would come uh, on, at nighttime so as not to be seen and would throw a pebble against their bedroom window to wake her so that she would come downstairs to unlock the door. So she was at the window of the attic for all, all night. I, I don't know how she did it. But finally, the Nazis left, and fortunately, again, they left in such a hurry that they didn't have time to do what they usually did. Wherever they stayed, they would burn the house down and kill all the occupants so as not to leave any trace of their pass and pa passage. But they, live, they left in such a hurry that they didn't have time to burn, to burn the house down and kill us all. Thank God. Oh, I forgot while... Um, while I, the, the Germans were there, my mother sent me to get some milk with my milk jug. And I was on a little road much smaller than this one, uh, a girl of what, I, what I was, 12. Um, and, and I came, a, a group of young German soldiers came towards me and said in German, hello, little blondie. And I was so scared. I looked at my feet and walked and walked and walked. I didn't. I understood what they were saying, but I just didn't even look up. Whew. So then um, the Germans leave and there's a famous bicycle story, which is really the center of our, the, the, the main miracle of the whole war. Next slide, please. That just to tells me that it's a bicycle story. Um, on the 30th, 
but I don't know. Um, yeah, on, it, it must be the 30th of August. My mother came home from shopping and I was playing with my brothers in the yard in front of the house. And I said to her when she arrived, Mama, the priest from the, from the church up on the hill came to see you, uh, but you went there. So he left a piece of paper for you on the kitchen table. And my mother went up the stairs with jelly in her legs. She was scared to death of what she would find there. She found a piece of paper that obviously had been torn out of a notebook and somebody wrote very hastily on it, um, Commander Levier and Mr. G, my father, are okay, but they need civilian clothing and money. Would one of the wives, preferably Madame G, my mother, uh, come to meet us with those things? My mother didn't uh, uh, ask anything else. She ran to Madame Levier, Claire, Tante Claire. She told her, our men are okay. I have to go meet them with some clothes for them and money. And I'm leaving on a bicycle. I, I have to rent a bicycle. And Maggie, who was 17 at the time, their younger daughter, said, Charlotte, I'm going with you. So my mother came home. She packed a quick bundle for us three children, took us quickly to Autran, and they rented two bicycles and the next morning took their whatever they had to, to take with them and their, um, their lunch, packed lunch and their bicycles and went up the hill. They pushed their bicycles up the hill. On the top, they sat down, ate their lunch, and then they started their descent. And as soon as they started descending, my mother found out that her brakes did not work. She had no brakes on a very windy mountain road going stiffly downhill. <clears throat> and she had a few seconds of the greatest anguish. What will happen? Either it's the abyss on one side or the rock on the other. What is going to happen? And providentially, in a hairpin curve, they both slipped on the gravel and fell and were drawn a few uh, yards on, on the gravel. And that was the end of their journey. And my mother was crying, you know, my husband, my husband, how am I going to go to see my husband, to find my husband? So they, 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 they crept towards the rock and sat down there on the ground and waited for people to pass. And somebody passed by and said, what can I do for you, madame? And they, they were kind of really uh, wounded on one side. I mean, nothing fatal, but uh, badly wounded. Uh, uh, and uh, my mother said, well, please go, go to Lens and get somebody to come and pick us up with any kind of transportation and take us to, a med to medical help. We need help and the, the person left. And the two women were waiting there. Uh, in the meantime, what had happened with the three men? They had been among the, the underground forces for a few weeks when they were told by their commander, sorry chaps, um, we are too few to resist the Nazis if they come up here. We are only 800. The Nazis think we are 8,000. Um, we have, so I'm giving the order to everybody, just disperse and run for your lives. Take care of yourselves, save your souls. So Serge and my father knew that the whole area around Grenoble where they would be passing by on their way back to Autran was completely uh, um, in, in Nazi land. And the Nazis had actually completely destroyed the whole area around Grenoble and especially on our side, on, on the side of Autran. <clears throat> the whole region had been devastated. There are several, several villages where they killed everybody from the newborns to the centenarians. They killed everybody. They killed the surgeons who were operating in a cave that they found. They killed everybody. <clears throat> and Henri, the young son-in-law, said, no, my, my, my daughter is going to be is one, one year old, and it's my second wedding, uh, wedding anniversary. I cannot wait to make a big day tour. I'm going straight. 
And the two men besieged him, please come with us, come with us. And he said, no, 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 I'm going straight. And unfortunately, very sadly, he was found, of course, by the Nazis and shot. So uh, the two men went, made a huge detour. It took them a long time to go from farm to farm and rake the hay here or do something else there to earn a bowl of soup and a, and a crust of bread. And they slept in barns and they hid in, in, on the side of the road in a ditch when the Germans were passing on the road. I don't know what they went through. I mean, I only know it from my parents' stories, but it must have been pretty awful. And they came to one village where the, the, the whole community was together talking with them. And the priest of the community said, I'm going to go to Autran to see how your families are, because obviously you are very um, uh, anxious about them. And my father says, please don't, we are Jews. We don't want you to risk our lives for us. And the priest said, all the better. I'm going, I want to help you. So, and if I'm to, so anyway, uh, to make a long story short, it's all in my book, all the details, but I can't tell it all here. So uh, he was turned away. Uh, he couldn't go to, all the way to Autran, but, <clears throat> sorry, he went to a, a colleague of his, where he had said mass the, the morning before. And he wrote that piece of paper that he asked his colleague to take to the next church. And from the next church, the priest would take it to the following church until that piece of paper reached my mother's kitchen table. And it took about a month. And when the priest came back to my father and said, well, I, I couldn't go to all the way to Autran, <clears throat> but I left a note for you, that, that would eventually go to you, get to your wife. My father thought, oh my God, if I know my, my wife, uh, she is going to jump on a bicycle and come straight and she will fall into Nazi hands. I mean, she won't make it. So he tried by all means to go as quickly as possible, day and night. I don't know how he did it. In the meantime, Serge had hurt his foot uh, with a rake. So my father was alone to do the, the last few miles. And he arrived in Lens, that little village near Autran. And he was totally exhausted and famished. And he saw a woman on the threshold of her house standing there. And he said, Madame, would you happen to know of a mode of transportation that, that is going to Autran where I can hitch a hike with because I can't go anymore and I have to get to Autran to, to, to get to my wife before she leaves. And she says, well, monsieur, you are in luck. There's just a horse-drawn cart uh, ready to leave to go pick up two ladies who had an accident on the road. And that's how my father found my mother and Maggie on the road to Autran. The real, the real miracle of all this is that if that accident had not stopped them from going, they would have taken a different road from the one that my father was coming up on and they would have gone straight into, they would have disappeared. They would have been gone. Talk about a miracle. I mean, that is a true story. It's not a movie. It should be made into a movie. Anyway, thank God. So I was told by Marraine uh, godmother is what we called Madame Mortonex. I was told by Marraine, your parents are fine. Uh, they will be here in two or three days to pick you up. We didn't know anything. By the way, I forgot one thing about Clairefontaine, the home where we were for a few months, the three of us. Madame Mortonex's son, Jean, was 11 and I was 10. And we were sweethearts. We, we really liked each other a very special way. And he took me into the, the meadows to guard the two cows that we had that gave us milk for all the children. <laughs> so I just wanted to add that. We had our, our own little romance. We, of course, never even touched hands. But it, it was kind of romantic, my, my first romance because I'm telling you this, I, I should have told you this because it comes up later. So anyway, in the fall of 44, Lyon started to become liber liberated from the South, I think by the Italians who now became pro 
<laughs> pro-French and pro-everybody instead of pro-Nazi. And we went back to Lyon to our apartment in the fall of 44. Next slide. And our landlady, oh, what I want to say is when we arrived back in Caluir from the, the, the mountain, uh, the Levier and Maggie and Michelle and Cassie, the baby, the little girl, came back with us and Madame Giron had spaghetti and meat sauce on the table for us and she had laundered our curtains. I will never forget this what they did for us. And they were never recognized, you know? Many people in France were very good to us and many were betrayed Jews. And we have two friends who were betrayed by, the, by, by French people and went to their death. My, so when we ba arrived back in Lyon, my, our landlady gave my parents this, uh, this envelope where somebody had changed our name to Gutmavor instead of A-N-N, -N, it was A-V-O-R. Somebody probably found that it was too Jewish a name and if any Nazi would find this at the post office, which was uh, controlled by the Nazis, it would be, uh, 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 it would give our name. I mean, uh, Gutmann, and they would have come for us. Uh, but we went there, of course. Now, inside was this note, a, a, a regular questionnaire, and it turned out that it was sent by my grandparents, Adolf and Ilse Levine, uh, from Gedera, from, uh, from Palestine. This was not Israel yet. And it was, what we understood was that the Red Cross told everybody in Palestine, if you want news from your loved ones in Europe, here the, the Red Cross is making it possible to send a message because no one in Palestine had any news from Europe and everybody was terribly worried and many people knew about concentration camps, which we didn't. My parents only learned about the concentration camps after we came back to Lyon, after the end of the war, and interestingly enough. So this was, in fact, not the Red Cross, but it says Delegatio Apostolica. So this looks like the Vatican. So it says, to Famille Rodolphe Gutmann, with our address, religion Jewish, race Semitic, and we, parents of Madame Charlotte Gutmann, we are well want, of, want your news, your parents, Adolphe and Elsa Levine. This was, in fact, unbeknownst to my grandparents, who meant well, a true denunciation. Uh, if the Germans had found this letter and opened it, they had all the, uh, the information they, they needed to at least come to our apartment. If we were still in the mountains, they would have burned the house down and killed our landlord and landlady if they didn't find us. So somebody well-meaning saved us again. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, this is just uh, in my book somewhere. It says it's dedicated to the bravery of several French families their lives to help save my family. Monsieur Placereau from the, the office in Paris who employed my father. Uh, Madame Megos, the secretary who went from Lyon to Grenoble once a week to bring my father work and to, to take his work back. Monsieur and Madame Raveau, our landlord and landlady in Autran, Madame Montonex in Clairefontaine, and Monsieur Montonex who took us in, and Monsieur and Madame Giron, the landlord and landlady in near Lyon, in Lyon. So eventually, uh, I mean, we grew up. Next slide. And this is my family after the war. I don't exactly know when, but I must have been 15. So it must have been 45 or 46, maybe. I, I, maybe I was, no, in 46, I was 14. So 46 or so, uh, Raymond would have been, well, he looks like seven or eight. So, so anyway, this is me and my mother here. 
And eventually uh, I worked, I became a nurse because I wanted to make Aliyah, or oh, I grew up with a huge inferiority complex and, a, a, and a, a, because feeling a secondhand citizen after the war as a teenager growing up as a Jewish person in a mostly Catholic country and born in Germany uh, with, against the, uh, which we just fought through the war. So I felt uh, really very little and I hated everything German and Germany and so. So I became a nurse to go to Israel because they needed nurses and, and I became a pediatric nurse. Eventually, by the grace of God, I met my husband. I was 24 at the time. I was hoping to meet my, my prince in sh uh, shining armor since I was 16 and always dreamt you know, of meeting the one. And of course, whenever I met a young man who was free, I would think before meeting him, maybe he'll be the one. And I knew I jinxed it. So I knew that I would never find anybody who would be interested in me. And the, the way I met my husband is a whole story in my book and you have to read it. Love at first sight, like you wouldn't believe. Next slide, please. This is the 30th of June, 1956, uh, July, sorry. We met on the 23rd of June and we were married on the 30th of July. He was passing through Paris for three days, coming on his way from Israel back to the States. And that is, uh, we met and we, we thought of a possible marriage in 45 minutes. And he asked to marry, me to marry him in 13 days. Uh, next is a slide of my family that day after our civil wedding. We had a civil wedding in Paris and then we made arrangements to go to to the States because my parents had had already tickets on a boat, uh, cards on a boat to go for their 25th wedding anniversary that September to America for the first time. So we had our religious wedding in Kansas City. And then um, the whole rest of my life is, is just extremely interesting. We lived in England and in Uganda and in Berkeley and in Canada. And unfortunately, my wonderful husband, we could still be married now. Uh, he was younger than me by nine months, but he died at, in, 55, in, in 88 at 55 of leukemia while we were living in Canada. So I came to Los Angeles where my eldest daughter was living and where I found Michel and Maggie again, the Levier daughters with whom I stayed friends until each of one passed away. And I'm still going now on uh, Thanksgiving for Thanksgiving dinner to Kathy's house, the, the baby during the war, whose father was shot by the Nazis. I still go to her house. She is in her seventies now. So, and I have known her all her life. Uh, I'm so grateful. So what happened with me in, 2011, in 2010 by sheer miracle again, I was introduced to the March of the Living which is an annual uh, trip for 12th graders, Jewish 12th graders. We go with survivors who told, tell their story to the students. We go to Poland for a, month, for a week to visit concentration camps and walk out of Auschwitz on Holocaust Day. And then we go for a week to Israel. And I've been going since 2011. I've gone nine times with the students and I love that trip and I live for that trip. And unfortunately, next slide, it was canceled uh, this year, but I hope to go next year, even though the big one was canceled internationally, I hope to go with a small group uh, because Auschwitz is still there. The day of the Holocaust will still be there and I'll be damned if I don't go next year. I want to go. So this is where, where we are in Auschwitz, about you see the building of Auschwitz behind us. And here my, my daughter and her husband uh, met me and that was 2011 or no, that was 2012. They, ca they came in 2012 uh, with uh, the adult group that, that came parallel to us. And in Auschwitz, we visited the museum the day before the march, next slide, and I fell in, fell uh, wide mouth open in front of this map. Next slide, please, in Auschwitz. 
which shows the railways during the war bringing from up to 1500 miles all the, the trains that brought Jews in the cattle cars to Auschwitz. And when I saw where Lyon is, Lyon is here, and we were so close to Lyon. It's unbelievable. You see Lyon here? Uh, if we had been taken, we were going straight to Auschwitz. I, I, I couldn't believe that map. I stayed in front of it for 10 minutes, thanking the Lord that we were not found. Now, in 2011, when I arrived in Israel, my daughter was visiting at the time, her daughter, and my granddaughter said, Mama, we found Jean Montonex, the 11 year old boy from the war. Remember the Montonex son of at Clairefontaine with whom I guarded the cows? They found actually his little cousin who gave us Jean's email address because he had the same name. And I spoke to Jean, Jean for the first time. Can you next slide, please? 70 years later, we went in 2012, the three generations, my granddaughter, my daughter, and I went to see Jean after the march in Nice in southern France, where he was living. He was already way in his 80s, and he was actually very sick with lung cancer. And I was so touched by his gentleness when he hugged me. It's as if we had never lost touch of each other for 70 years. Can you imagine this? And he gave me the name of the two girls who lived in the yellow house in Autran. And I got in touch with them before our trip. And then we went to Autran after we saw Jean and his wife and we had a lovely get together overnight with them. We took them to the restaurant and he unfortunately died a few months later, but he was so happy to see me. I was really moved. Uh, and his wife said, We've, I've heard so much about the Gutmann children. It's so wonderful to, to see what has become of at least some of them. And we told them who are, where our family was and all that. And, um, and then we went to Autran. We had rented a car and we went to Autran. Next slide. No, no, not, not that one. Oh, that's, yeah, that one, yeah. No, 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 no. No, up, 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 up. There, no, up, here, here, stay here. No, oh, no, yeah, yes. Here are, is the old picture of Les Raveaux, the Raveaux with their children during the war. And here are the two ladies. Uh, this is Colette, this one, and uh, Georgette, who is now also uh, 90 years old. And they both have big families, and Colette lives in the yellow house. She has, in, of course, inherited the yellow house from her parents who are, have died long ago. And, oh, uh, next slide. Where is the slide with the two homes? No, uh, before that before that oh no oh no go, go mm. okay uh, okay go wait 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 slowly slowly go up slowly here yeah i, I will show you oh uh, i forgot to show you the mountain x have been inscribed in yad vashem this is their honor diploma okay uh go further further. There, there, this one. There, this is the old picture with the yellow house. And this is what it looked when we went in 2012. Now they built a roundabout here, of course. They, but here's the, still the church, which is there. And on a, bigger, on a bigger picture of this, we still see this building there also on, on that photograph, but it doesn't show. So anyway, uh, we had a wonderful time with them. It's as if um, after 70 years, it's as if we had never lost touch with each other, which shows how people bond when they go through certain 
uh, dangerous together. And we ask them, actually, I ask them, were you afraid when the Nazis were eating at your place and sleeping in our, in our, in our uh, bedroom upstairs? And they said, no, we felt quite safe because we already had two Nazis in the house, so nobody would bother us. So anyway, um, my, around these days, uh, thanks to the March of the Living in part, and thanks to other circumstances, we met a woman, next slide, uh, there, yeah. Uh, a very, uh, a German non-Jewish woman from Berlin who belongs to the Action Reconciliation Service for Peace who became a history teacher when she, when she um, heard what her father, who was a Nazi, did. And he died actually two months after she was born. But he was writing to her mother terrible letters against the Jews. And she vowed to work for the, Jew, for the Jews and Jewish causes all her life. And she lived in Israel many times, worked for rabbis, and is now putting plaques into the um, sidewalk. Next slide. No, next. There. Uh, these plaques, these um, are called the stumbling stones. Uh, they are small, uh, about, about this square, not very big, embedded in the sidewalks in front of homes from where Jews were taken straight to concentration camps and to their deaths. And when they, when they go street by street and look who lived here, who lived here, and what happened to them, and when they find Jews who were taken by the Nazis straight to, to their deaths, they look for their families through a number of international and German archives and try to, to find the relatives, um, hoping to invite them for the ceremony when they put the plaques in and also hoping for a donation because they are all volunteers work to do that and these people were actually uh, aunts uh, cousins she uh, um, Mina was I think a cousin of my grandmother it, it goes far up there but anyway this so next slide please and my granddaughter visited um, Sigrun and went to Berlin and here they are in front of this house I think where the Riesenburgers lived and here they are looking at the various plaques in the ground. You see how small they are? And you have to actually bend to read them because they are written pretty small so that you pay homage at the same time as you read them and remember the people. So this is one woman and, and she became a very good friend of our family and invited me back to Berlin. And I had never been back to Germany. I, I, would hate, I hated the idea. And because I loved her and she was good to the Jews and because she invited me, I decided to go back to Germany. Next, and they took me, she took me to see the university where my, my, my mother was in medical school, which changed names. Uh, and the, this is the building where my father had his office. He was a partner with a Monsieur Borsch. Mr. Borsch, and when my father actually left for Paris, he told Mr. Borsch, you should leave too. It was a man in his 50s. And Mr. Borsch said, no, 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 this will all blow over. And of course, he and his wife did not make it, unfortunately. Um, so, and then they took us, they took me to Driesen, where my mother was born. Next slide. And here you see the old, the old photograph. And this is the place right now. I tried to take a picture at the same, in the same area. And you see this house here with this funny shape. It's there still. So we didn't find where my grandfather had his shop, but I'm sure it was here. And this is the, the railway and the platform where my mother took the train every day to go to high school, two hours going one way, two hours back to go to high school for several years. And now I just want to show you my children. I'm about done. I want to show you my children. Next slide. My, oh, no, 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 sorry. No, sorry. Go back. That one, I forgot about that one. Um, we met another woman. Uh, oh, this is a story in Auschwitz in, I don't remember which year, 2015 or 16. I wanted to thank some Polish people who came to, to walk with the Jews 
uh, to show their support. In, in Poland, there are many people who are anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, and, and quite a few who support the Jews. So I, as we were waiting to walk out of Auschwitz, I thought, I want to find some Polish people to thank them for coming with us. And I saw three ladies, who, gray haired ladies, who obviously did not look Jewish, and she was, they were just standing by themselves. And I went to them and I said, excuse me, ladies, are you, Jew are you Polish? And the, this lady here, Rose, said, no, we are German. And I somehow had a flutter <laughs> in my diaphragm. And she took me in her arms, she hugged me, and she said, and she whispered into my ear, I thank the God Almighty for having, served, for having um, preserved you until now. And of course, I started crying, and she started crying, and we found this this meeting of a Jew and a, and, and a German in Auschwitz of all places, uh, like an omen. It was time for me to lay, lay away my fear, my, my hatred and everything to just let it go. It was time. And this lady, she belongs to the International Christian Embassy Jerusalem. It's another uh, of these many German non-Jewish organizations now who are pro-Israel and pro-Jewish and who work for the Jews. And we have exchanged the most incredible, incredible emails. And it's all in my book. So next, next slide is almost the end. Uh, there is my son with his second wife uh, in, living in Canada. Here are my three children at Echanuka. I think I was 85. Now I'm 88. This is my eldest daughter here. Um, with, uh, with her husband, Ilana, and her husband, Mark, with her eldest daughter, Diane, married to Gilad, and they live in Jerusalem, Jeru and have two children, so they are my two great-grandchildren, and my sec her second, her smaller sister, her younger sister, and her husband, both are now rabbis. I'm very, very proud of my family. And this is my second daughter, uh, uh, Tamar, with her husband, Brian, and their two children, uh, uh, Rachel and Joel. And they all have jobs and they are working. And this is a picture a long time ago, maybe, maybe eight years ago of my six grandchildren. So I have six grandchildren and two great grandchildren. Next slide, whom you will see on there, my two great grandchildren. And this is in memory of my mother who was really instrumental in saving us and she was unhappy all her life that she could not become the doctor that she vowed to be at, at five, at the age of five. But she did many good things in her life and she worked for Hadassah Vizzo uh, for many years. And my last slide is my book, which if you are interested in getting it, uh, it's available uh, on Amazon, Eva's Uncommon Life Guided by Miracles. Thank you very much for listening. And now I'll be happy to take questions. I hope it wasn't too long. Ava, thank you so much for sharing your story with us this afternoon. Um, before I get into some questions, I just want to let you know that we had several people commenting um, and just thanking you so much for sharing your story. And they just really appreciated it. One of our yeah visitors even said it was the highlight of their week and today is thursday so it's been thank a long you. week over. <laughs> thank so, you so grateful that you were able to share your story with us um so thank you we do have a few questions um i'm bothered you know, by the, wants, by the excuse me to know I my, my, oh, oops. Of course. okay um, well let's See, to our visitor who wants to know when Ava will be speaking again, we don't know yet, but she certainly will be, so stay tuned. Well, it would be the same story. I don't change my story. Every inch is the, the truth. Um, we just have a lot of people saying thank you, as I mentioned. Um, one question, when, um, when you share your story, particularly with what do you hope that they get out of it? What's the most important thing you'd like them to take away? Uh, well, they want to hear about survivors because we have to remember what happened. We cannot forget. So that is my, my task now is to tell my story along with other survivors who tell theirs. Um, 
we must not forget and, and also never give up. Uh, and, and so be grateful, be so grateful. Uh, when something bad happens, there's always a silver lining to it. Look for it and be grateful for it. But we were so fortunate. Thank you, Eva. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, somebody wants to know if you ever met anybody wearing a purple triangle. No. And I never met as a child anybody with a Jewish star because we were in hiding. We, we took off before... Uh, people were supposed to wear them, even in Lyon. Um, A lot of wisdom. Well, I think your story was so thorough because a lot of our comments are just people thanking you so much again and saying that they loved listening to you. We do have a couple of requests, though. Um, people would like to hear a joke from you, since you said you love telling jokes. If you happen to have one offhand that you'd be willing to share. Uh, what? Sorry? I didn't... Uh, some people have, have requested that they would like you to tell one of your jokes that you said you, you love oh, telling. Oh, one of my it. jokes. Okay, well, I have one which is perfectly all right, because many of my jokes are kind of little risque. Nothing too bad, but risque nevertheless. But for this audience, I should stay on the, on the good side. Uh, so I have one. Um, <clears throat> uh, a Jewish couple wins the lottery. And so they go to Beverly Hills and buy a mansion and move in. And they hire a very styled, highly styled British butler, obviously not Jewish. And the, the lady of the house is very happy with his service. And before she goes shopping, she instructs him. She says, Hugh, please, when you set the table for dinner tonight, set it for, a, for, for four because our friends, the coins are coming to dinner. And so when she comes back from shopping, she finds that Hugh has set the table for eight. So she says, how come? I've asked you to set the table for four. Why did you set it for eight? And <laughs> I hope I don't mess it up. <laughs> and, and he says, oh, the coins called while you were gone and they said they were bringing the knishes and the blintzes. I appreciate that joke a lot. Thank you, Ava. <laughs> he didn't. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Well, Ava, I just wanted to again say thank you so much. And as I mentioned um, to everybody at the beginning, Ava just started uh, speaking at the museum about two or three weeks before we had to start working you from home. But it's been such an honor to get to know you because Ava has been so involved with our Zoom programs that we do with students on a regular basis. So uh, we're so grateful to have you share your story with our community today. And you had people watching from all over California and even visitors from Austria tuned in today. So uh, thank you. Um, this My is pleasure. Such a special we look so forward to welcoming you back. And of course, to all of our audience, um, as soon as it's safe, we look forward to welcoming you at the museum. But in the meantime, please keep and follow our Facebook page and our website because we have virtual programs on a regular basis. We have Holocaust survivors share their stories every Thursday at 11 o'clock. Um, next Thursday at 11, we have Dr. Jacob Eisenbach, a survivor from Poland who will share his story. So we look forward to seeing you then, and we wish everyone a healthy and safe week. And again, thank you so much, Eva. Thank you very much, and thank you for your patience. My pleasure.